In the first episode of Nathan Fielder's new show, The Rehearsal, there's a comparison the first guest, Core, gives to Nathan, that being the eccentric and zany chocolatier, one William Wonka. Which I think, given its contextual placement, is definitely fitting. Fielder, much like our Candyman, has chosen a specific person to help and is behind the scenes pulling all the strings in order to make the rehearsal go as smoothly as possible. They even play one of the songs from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but as much as I'd love to dive deep into comparison of the Oompa Loompas to the child actors of the rehearsal, I think there's actually a better comparison for Fielder in this series. One a little more magical. The plan? To prove to the world that Nathan Fielder bears more similarities to the Wizard of Oz, and tricking people along the way into subscribing to me on the hit website, youtube.com. This is Hizzy for You. Before diving into the Oz of it all, I'd like to first preface about performative art, which is loosely what the rehearsal is. In most cases with performative art, it's how the piece speaks to you that's important. So in doing this video, it's my interpretation while watching the rehearsal, what I get out of it. I only feel the need to make this clarification because last year I made a video on how I viewed Bo Burnham's Inside and got a decent amount of comments telling me how I was wrong. And I think the rehearsal is even more interpretable from what the meaning behind it is or how much, if any, is meant to be real or strictly for show. So while I find it interesting to see what other people take from this series, I don't really care if you think I'm wrong. But enough of that, let's follow the yellow brick road to get to the actual meat and potatoes of the video. We all know The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, Toto, the first person in history wanting to go back to Kansas, and honestly before writing this I hadn't rewatched The Wizard of Oz in over a decade and never realized the main points of the plot are hinted at in the opening act of the film. There's a lot of great aspects to dive into on how this film simultaneously works as a fun children's fantasy and substance to take away when you think deeper on it. The spectacular presentation of the Technicolor from Becky Sharp. The whimsical music to match its visual vibrancy. It's a classic, you get it. But we're not exploring that. I want to talk about the man behind the curtain. In The Wizard of Oz, they finally get to the great and powerful man known as Oz, only to realize on their second visit that he's an old man using tricks to appear more imposing. Once discovered by Detective Toto, the great powerful wizard quickly scrambles on rewards for our brave adventurers. Then he offers to go with Dorothy to Kansas in his hot air balloon, only for Toto to jump out, leaving him flying off on his own due to his incompetence. And I get in a lot of ways this whole journey is meant to be interpreted as a fictitious adventure based on the beginning, but I can't help but question Oz's whole shtick. It feels weird that he plays a majority of the major players that we see in the Emerald City, from the doorman to the guard to the coachman. All this feels intentional for the background of Oz. If he's playing most of the parts, then what's the point of being in charge? See what type of fella you are. You know what you are? You remind me of the Wizard of Loneliness, because you're your own self, your own wizard. That's what you are. <laughs> this is where the comparisons to the rehearsal start to percolate in my mind. There's the immediate similarity in that Nathan offers these solutions for people that likely already have the power to accomplish what they're asking for. They just need the encouragement to do so. Based on what we see from Kor and his friend, he likely could have easily told her this information on a good night of trivia. Now is that all because Nathan invalidated the sanctity of trivia by getting the questions and slowly feeding him the answers? So it's days like these that I curse the Chinese for inventing gunpowder. I think to me, Kor had the courage inside of him to conquer his fears, but just needed the confidence and the push to lead him in the right direction. The same can be said about fake Angela or Thomas, but specifically fake Angela already likely has the ability to act as well as she shows. I don't think the fielder method is specifically unlocking her abilities. So this is again someone rewarded from the rehearsal that already had what they needed inside of them. Then there's Nathan and Angela. Similar to the events in Wizard of Oz, we see Angela unable to continue this rehearsal unless she has someone playing the father figure with her. Of course, when Nathan steps in. Almost like Oz going with Dorothy back to Kansas only for her to leave the blimp and, much like Nathan, be alone looking like a fool. There's my sleepy baby. <laughs> On top of this, Nathan plays a ton of different roles much like Oz that make me question to what end. If it's just for the sake of comedy, sure, it's funny, but there does feel like there's quite a bit more going on in this show. I think part of this lingering weirdness is intentional and asks us to discuss the material, because Nathan Fielder wants you to see and talk about the man behind the curtain. 
If the intention was just to be a weird comedy, that would be one thing, but there's enough of the manipulation left in the edit to show you the great lengths he goes to in order to keep the show running. But by the end of this, it's only a Nathan Fielder rehearsal, which is weird. Like, he created the show in order to do some wacky and crazy scenes of possible outcomes that will happen, only to arrive with a man grappling with how he would commit to fatherhood in a completely controlled environment. Which brings me back to the original question. To what points are the efforts of Oz and Nathan in their respective works? In the case of Oz, it feels like eccentric fragility. He allegedly has power over the Emerald City to do whatever he so pleases, and he still needs to perform trickery as part of his life all to keep you from uncovering the man behind the curtain. Which I don't think is the same thing that's going on in the rehearsal, in large part due to the setting in the piece, Fielder's rehearsal wonderland is far more comedic than the utopic Emerald City. However, despite this comedy being a central part, the other key element, the one that feels more prevalent, is Fielder's need to want to show you the man behind the curtain, because he's presumably given a lot of freedom on how this is viewed in the final edit. There's a huge tonal shift from episode one to two in terms of scope of the project, possibly because a certain big event, you know, the release of Bloodshot 2020. But it shifts from following a man's trivia routine to a through line with full surveillance of a test mother. And what's interesting is despite differing levels of control, the outcomes end with Nathan inserting himself in each of these two rehearsals, with practicing telling Core about the trivia cheating and him joining Angela in the fake parenting exercise. In both, he's now included himself in the experiment. I think an argument could be made that it's more funny the more Nathan is included. But I kind of disagree with this because the show could do the fun Nathan hijinks without him getting directly involved. I think this is meant as a means to show the illusion of power that Nathan has on this show. Despite him being the main creative working on this, creating those elaborate sets, getting a whole rotation of child actors, getting the answers for trivia, and all the other moving pieces. Cord is one of the outcomes they didn't rehearse. The Scion TC guy leaves the first day. The Gold Digger guy doesn't show up when they need to do the final rehearsal. Angela decides to quit the rehearsal before it's finished. One of the child actors thinks of Nathan as more than just a pretend dad. All of the participants, besides the actors of the rehearsal, can't be controlled even though the power is in the hands of those making the project. Any of these could have been left out and chosen new subjects to try to get more successful outcomes, but instead we're left with these failures. Even with Nathan's own rehearsal, which he has full control of, proved to be a failure. Depending on how you view the ending, he doesn't confess to Kor. He has to restart his child's development because he's been gone too long. He calls himself your dad when he's pretending to be the mother of the heartbroken child. Whether the last one was an actual flub or a calculated choice, to me it doesn't affect what the show is saying. The message still coincides with everything else we see prior to that, in that even with the power to rehearse situations or weigh outcomes in your favor, all of that gives you no control for actual life. There's so many decisions that we would all regret if we dwelled on the numerous outcomes that could have happened, and instead we're only left with the path we're on currently. Nothing can rehearse you for the future. So despite both Nathan and Oz playing all the parts to make the show go on, they still both end up like an emperor without his clothes. Quack, 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 quack.